Coming up on show 870, BMW's iNext is going to be a 600 brake horsepower monster. Stick around, I'll give you the details. Plus, Tesla gets approval for its first construction stage at Giga Berlin. CATL wants to boost EV range by making cell-to-pack technology. And the Renault Twingo ZE gets its official WLTP range. Well, good morning, good afternoon or good evening, wherever you're listening in the world. Welcome to EV News Daily. Uh, This is the show for Tuesday, 18th of August. My name is Martin Lee, and I go through every EV story, so you don't have to. Well, thank you, as always, to myev.com. If you're in the US and you haven't checked it out yet, where have you been? But that's okay. If you're new to the podcast, check out My EV. It's a a free marketplace where you can search only electric vehicles. If they have a plug socket on, you'll find them on myev.com all over the US. It doesn't matter where you are, and you'll be surprised... For some of those used prices as well, if you're not in the position to buy a brand new EV uh, in the US, the used prices, I think, are much more competitive over here. People are still selling Tesla Model 3s on after driving 12,000 miles in the last year, sticking them on the websites for about the price you can get them new from Tesla and just promising, you know, instant delivery, not waiting for the next boat to arrive. I'm sure there's a market for that because people seem to be buying them. But what are you thinking? Just sit on your hands for a month and wait for a brand new one. Anyway, let's get on with the news today. BMW's iNext will be available in three versions. BMW knows it needs to get the production version of the iNext. And who knows what it's going to be called? Possibly the iX, maybe. They've got to get it right because it's going to face stiff competition from electric SUVs. So it needs to look good got to be high tech, and it's got to have good range, got to have fast charging, and be very high performance, says Inside EVs. Well, the entry-level iNext will have 308 horsepower, which is a nice kind of uh, mid-range SUV runabout to give you a bit of poke when you want it. The mid-range model will have 522 horsepower. Now you're talking. But there will be a top-of-the-range model with 610 horsepower in quite a small SUV form factor. That EV is going to be rapid as heck. Uh, The base model will come with, well, all of them, including the base model, will come with a dual motor all-wheel drive setup. The level of performance will, of course, vary, the most powerful version being twice as as powerful as that entry-level model. And we still don't know the exact reveal date for the production model. We've seen more spy shots, even the official production name. I don't think it's going to be called the iNext. I think that's just a a working title. Like the Porsche Taycan used to be called Mission E as a working title. Then it came out as Taycan, which was a shame, because Mission E is a very cool name, but I kind of get that with Porsche, with the, you know, the McCann and the Taycan, Taycan sort of thing. Anyway, that's a digression. BMW has confirmed that series production will commence in July 2021. We're 11 months away now. Going on sale in Europe very shortly after, and in the US, having to wait just a little bit longer, up to a year extra to get the BMW i next. Maybe it's called the iX, not to be confused with the i4, which is another BMW which is indeed coming. That'll be more of a uh, saloon car, think more Audi A4, kind of Tesla Model S-ish competitor, I think, anyway. Uh, Volvo's XC40 is next in the news today. And Volvo XC40 diesels are no longer on sale. Uh, Volvo has removed all diesel versions of the XC40 from sale uh, in the UK as it moves away from the diesel fuel in favour of electric cars, says the magazine Auto Car, where I found this. Well, a Volvo UK spokesman claimed the decision is, and I quote, is part of Volvo Car's ambitious global electrification strategy, which includes our well-established commitment to the phasing out of diesel in the long term. It also reflects the strong shift in customer demand towards petrol and electric models, end quote. Well, available at the moment, if you search the XC40 on the Volvo website, which I may have done once or many, many times, there are two recharge models. This is my first issue with the way the Volvo are doing this. You can get the Volvo Recharge... Or you can get the Volvo Recharge, and you have to read the small print because it's the Volvo Recharge plug-in hybrid and the Volvo Recharge full electric. But it's not clear, and maybe it's just me, uh, but it's not clear because they don't really... It's just There's two cars with the same name, which is, first of all, not ideal, but I guess there's a method to their madness. Uh, however, if you do get the Volvo XC40 Recharge full electric, yes, you are paying... Well, the first edition, I must add. The first edition, you are paying £60,000 for that. And that's before you get jiggy with the options list. You know, which I've done. It's very highly specced. 
And it's been a, a couple of weeks since I last dreamt and had a little play with the configurator. But I think there's some other stuff that you can add on there as well, like the semi-automatic tow hitch. I think that is an optional extra. Maybe I'm thinking of the Polestar 2. But when you think about it, this car is on the same platform as the Polestar 2. Now, the Polestar 2 is £50,000. OK, it's a little bit under 50000 without the performance pack. So you're getting your uh, Brembo brakes and the Olin's dampers and your fancy pants seatbelt colours with the Polestar 2, and it's a little bit over 50000 if you do spec that. But the XC40 Recharge, full electric, is a much more practical car, I think. I think it actually kind of looks more conventional as well. Polestar is definitely a, a, a bit of a work in design. But when you think about it, why is the XC40 Recharge, although it's a bit bigger, can carry some more stuff, if you've got kids and dogs and stuff, maybe it'll go better in that, why is it £10,000 more than the Polestar 2? I don't know. I don't think it's £10,000 more of car. It's the same underneath as the Polestar. Obviously tuned down a little bit. Not so sporty. Maybe you get more for your money. I'm not sure. Like, you get more specs, possibly. I've compared the two. I can't see ten grand's worth of difference. But either way, there's no denying that if you want the plug-in hybrid version of the Recharge, well, <laughs> the XC40 Recharge, small print, plug-in hybrid, uh, then it's 40 grand. If you want the XC40 Recharge, small print, full electric, then it's 60, like you're 20,000 pounds extra for the full electric. I think there's a real EV premium going on there. I hope that disappears sooner rather than later, because I'm not sure it's worth that premium. It's still a mega, mega car. Other Volvos like the XC90, the next gen XC90, if you're not familiar, that is the seven seat SUV that is also ditching diesel and will only be available in electric and hybrid variants. OK, let's talk Tesla. Been a little while since we had a big Tesla section on the podcast. Let's crack through a couple of Tesla stories that you may have missed. Elon, first of all, says that Tesla's developing a beast neural network. This is a training computer. He took to Twitter a couple of days ago to share a new developments and revealed that Tesla is developing a neural network training computer called Dojo, D-O-J-O. And it's going to be a beast. They're his words, says. Interesting engineering. A follower then asked Elon what will be the next big public release that shows a big leap in autopilot full self-driving. And Elon responded that the full self-driving improvement will come as a, and I quote, quantum leap. The full self-driving improvement, he says, will come as a quantum leap because it's a fundamental architectural rewrite, not an incremental tweak. I drive the bleeding edge alpha build in my car personally, almost at zero interventions between home and work, limited public release in six to ten weeks, end quote. Well, Elon added that going from 2D to 4D, so basically seeing a flat picture to a three-dimensional image and 4D being time, so calculating the movement of objects as well, that is being a signposted as a giant improvement. The new system will interpret things like traffic lights, stops, turns and changes in acceleration in video settings. Also talking about... Uh, Tesla for what is essentially a tech company, and long-term listeners have heard me call them this before. They're not really a car company, are they? They're a tech company. They're an energy company as well, but really they're a Silicon Valley company that just happens to make, oh, stick your finger in the air, cars. I mean, like that, they are essentially a tech outfit. I'm so surprised they don't have two-factor authentication in a world of hackers and where hackers can do lots of damage. We saw what happened recently with Twitter. Elon Musk tweeted a couple of days ago that two-factor authentication is embarrassingly late. That's his words, embarrassingly late, but apparently on the way now, he didn't provide a timeline. He did say last year that it was soon, and we're a year later now, but he did say on Twitter that 2FA, which features an additional step to verify your identity, is in final validation stage, says The Verge. Uh, Tesla's 2FA is going to be available via SMS and authentication. Authenticator. Now, I use the Authenticator app because I find it's more secure. I don't know about you, but I read about those stories in the news where somebody in a phone shop was intercepted or bribed. It happens over the years. And if they want to intercept your text messages, uh, there is technology where they can change the account and change where your texts are being sent to. There's SMS uh, fraud and SIM card fraud as well. So actually, if you have two-factor authentication, I recommend the Authenticator apps. It's a faff. I, I must admit, it is a faff. But those areas of my life that I do want to keep uh, you know, locked down, everything from the podcast publishing platform to my blog platform at evnewsdaily.com, like if I ever got compromised, just be, you know, 
ultimately somebody could delete everything, although there's backups, but it would be embarrassing. So everything is locked down with two-factor authentication where I possibly can. And I know I use the or, or Google Authenticator uh, apps and the, and the other authenticator apps as well that are, that are out there just because I think that's the safest that you can possibly be, hopefully. And that's now coming to Tesla as well. So uh, when you think about how much data Tesla holds on you and the things that you do online in your life with Tesla, it's good that they're adding more layers of security. Okay, a couple more Tesla stories. Tesla's received approval to begin the next phase of construction at the site at Giga Berlin. On August 17th, the Brandenburg State Office of the Environment approved the early start of Tesla's next construction phase for the Berlin Giga Factory. Construction crews on site can now begin driving piles as part of the foundational work, says Joey for Tesla Rati. The main issue that arose from the request was the protection of groundwater at Giga Berlin, refueling the pile drivers. I guess with fossil fuels, uh, Tesla's crews now have to use a special kind of fueling process to avoid chemicals being spilled on the ground and contaminating groundwater. The required protective materials on the ground will eliminate the possibility of polluting the local water supply located at Giga Berlin's landmass. Additionally, more requirements will be made that ensure local roads and railways are not damaged from the vibrations that will naturally occur during the pile driving process. I'll pop a link to Tesla Arty in the show notes if you'd like to read more. And finally on Tesla today, uh, the development, I've talked about this before on the podcast, it is now uh, underway. The world's largest battery storage facility, uh, Tesla and PG&E, the uh, energy provider, are uh, now uh, groundbreaking has happened and the construction of the world's largest battery storage facility at Moss Landing in Monterey, California. Uh, the energy storage unit will have 730 megawatt hours of energy uh, to be able to provide the local grid and supplying the grid for up to four hours uh, using 256 of Tesla's mega packs. Uh, Tesla and PG&E will have the option to upgrade Moss Landing's capacity in the future to 1.21 gigawatts. I joke not. 1.21 gigawatts, uh, according to Tesla's report. However, that's no coincidence, surely. Uh, however, uh, you can power every home in the state of San Francisco for a quarter of the day with that, says Construction Review Online. The battery storage facility will be launched in 2021, will be designed, constructed and maintained by Tesla and PG&E. And the construction of the Moss Landing site and other mega storage products ar projects around the world show how much of a massive shift there is away from hydrocarbon based power systems towards renewable generation backed up by grid level storage. Well, there's a new warranty product on sale in the UK. Assurant is the RAC's partner. In after sales, they've launched a product called EV1. It's a warranty available to all of the dealer network's 1,500 dealers, and it can be applied to any used electric vehicle up to a maximum of eight years old with 80,000 miles on the clock at the time of purchase, according to the website motortrader.com. Uh, well, cover can be for a variety of periods, up to two years, and claims can be made at the dealer uh, and uh, of, or almost any other uh, dealer participating up to a limit of the vehicle's purchase price. Well, Sean Kent is the RAC Director of Sales at Assurance and says, and I quote, this is a very timely development with EVs and hybrids, especially plug-ins appearing on the used car market in large numbers and for the first time outside of dealer franchise networks. There's a massive public interest in these vehicles. But used car customers can be quite conservative in their buying choice. The new warranty provides a comprehensive level of cover and it's designed to deliver, pe to deliver peace of mind uh, for those moving away from uh, polluting petrol and disgusting diesel, end quote. I may have added polluting and disgusting to that quote. Uh, of course, if you want to find out more, I'll pop a link in the show notes to that web story. Now, let's talk a battery story today. The Chinese battery maker CATL is looking to boost the range of EVs by packing batteries into vehicle frames itself, according to a Reuters report published uh, a couple of days ago. Uh, distributing battery cells around a car allows for more cells to be put in the car rather than making the cells into modules 
and those big cumbersome modules being made into a battery pack. Well, that increases energy storage capacity and it increases range and it will allow future EVs to go, well, with a reasonable size battery pack, 500 miles or more. The CATL chairman, Zheng Yukuang, uh, said at an industry conference in Wuhan in China a couple of days ago, according to Green Car Reports. Not the first time this has been talked about or attempted. Back in 2018, Swedish researchers said they were looking at making the entire vehicle body the battery itself, but encased in carbon fibre. Volvo experimented with storing energy in body panels using a composite material made from carbon fibre. But barriers do remain and safety is one. Placing the battery in the middle of the vehicle away from the crush zones in a centralised battery pack has helped make EVs more predictable for the first responders in crashes, knowing that the battery, in most cases, will be under the occupants. A couple more stories, a couple more cars to talk about. The Renault Twingo ZE. That gets its official WLTP ratings now, and it is now appearing on the official websites of Renault in Germany and France, and the WLTP rating is out. Good and bad news, according to Pedro at Push EVs, the bad news is that Renault's onboard charger is woefully inefficient at low currents, charging at 10 amps. It only has a 70% efficiency. Uh, To have a decent charging efficiency, you need a high current, at least 16 or 32 amps, actually, is recommended. Uh, Having Bearing this in mind, when you choose your... A charger, your EVSE, uh, if you have an electric car made, made by Renault, is something that you should bear in mind. The WLTP range, though, what have we talked about? Well, a combined range of 190 Ks, that's 118 miles, and that is from a 22 kilowatt hour battery pack for what is still a very expensive car for a small battery and low mileage. It is Comparable to the Seat, Mi, Electric, and any of those trio of cars really from the VW group, uh, like the Skoda, Citigo, IV, a WLTP range of those cars is 161 compared to 118 for the Twingo. 161 miles for the Seat Mi uh, from a 36.8 kilowatt hour battery. Unfortunately, both the Twingo and those triplets from VW group are really only backup cars for their makers. They are EVs that Renault and the Volkswagen Group will eventually try to sell only if the sales of the more profitable cars, the Zoes of the world and the ID3s of the world, aren't enough to meet the 2020 EU emissions targets. It's like keeping them in the back pocket, if you like. Not very compelling EVs, but they can kind of reduce the price of them, turn them on, sell more cars and they'll do a job for them, but they're not fully behind them, I guess is the essence of what we're saying. And finally, the Kia e-Nero full EV is number one in the Netherlands. Uh, Lots to celebrate there. And uh, Max Verstappen doing well in the Formula One, and electric cars doing well on the roads. Overall, 5,500 plug-in vehicles were sold last month in July, a new year best, putting the year-to-date tally into positive numbers. Full year, 15% up year over year, says Clean Technica. The Kia e-Nero won, or Nero EV as it's called there, uh, won the trophy in July, uh, beating out in second place the MG ZS EV. Who'd have thunk it? You get a lot of car for your money with the MG. Uh, thanks to a year best score of 501 units. And in third place, they're still selling the VW e-Golf, even though the ID3 is only minutes away. The e-Golf still does really, really good business. It'd be very embarrassing in some markets if the e-Golf continues to outsell the ID3. And I'm not sure VW will let that happen. Hey, that's your show for today. Hope you enjoyed it. Long one, but loads of news to get through. I'd love to hear from you. You can drop by the blog, which is evnewsdaily.com, or you can email me. Uh, the address is hello at evnewsdaily.com. Leave a comment on the show notes, uh, sorry, on the YouTube comments if you want to. Eight hundred and sixty nine shows live in the archive. I tell you what, if you could do me a massive favour, if you can't support me on Patreon, and it's fine, honestly, no problems. Um, and I will always make this show either way. But if you can support on Patreon, and it's like five or ten dollars a month, and that is you know, a posh coffee once or twice a month. Maybe you're not even having those because your commute is cut down and you can support this show happening. That would be amazing. And if you can leave a little review, if if Patreon's not for you, but you can leave a review on Apple iTunes or on your app or or wherever you get Apple podcasts, uh, that's the place to leave a review. And it really helps 
to grow the show. Uh, premium partners, thank you, Phil Roberts of Electric Future, Brad Crosby, Avid Technology, Porsche of the Village in Cincinnati, Audi of Cincinnati East, Volvo Cars of Cincinnati East, NationalCarCharging.com and AlohaCharge.com. And now Derek Riley, he runs the EV Review Island YouTube channel. Have a wonderful day. I'll catch you tomorrow. And remember, there's no such thing as a self-charging hybrid.